All right, well, officially, welcome everybody to the ninth uh, webinar in our series during this pandemic, uh, allowing us all to meet from all over the world uh, in this incredible Zoom format um, where um, uh, time is a limitation for us to some degree. I know we probably don't have a lot of people from Australia or the Asia Pacific region. You're uh, uh, at a time that uh, makes this tricky. Uh, but space is no longer a limitation. So we can gather together from all over the world, which we've been doing. Uh, people from Manila, uh, people from South Africa, from Wales, from Italy, from Spain, uh, from Canada and the United States, uh, from South America, uh, from Seoul, South Korea. Uh, and I wanna welcome everybody that's here this morning. Uh, we decided to do a round two with Rachel because uh, we um, learned so much with Rachel about the importance of mindset and the growth mindset and failure tolerance. Uh, but I wanted to get into the weeds a little bit with Rachel on some of the practical details because I know a lot of our audience uh, is bearing witness right now to guiding by the side, the Alfred model, as opposed to always being the superhero like Batman. Um, and we're using um, the constraint of the pandemic uh, where we are not able to use our hands, uh, nor are we able to really uh, coach things up in the same way. Uh, we're not able to correct things with the, the fine detail that you can do in person and only in person. Um, so we're having to use more variability. We're having to be more intelligent about uh, how we design the tasks in the programming uh, to bring people towards the edge of their capability in relevant and relatable ways so that they can um, uh, feel that it makes sense to them. They can understand the why behind the what of what we're doing um, and see the value of uh, this approach to, to rehab and musculoskeletal health. Um, I think uh, for a lot of us, um, besides the eye fatigue, uh, we're finding, as Rachel Locke, my good friend in London, said that, that surprisingly, people report back to us that they um, uh, feel that uh, uh, there is something more personal. There's something that's even of a higher level of connection, ironically, uh, because there are fewer interruptions for one reason. Um, and who knows all the reasons. Um, but when we're constrained away from providing the quick fix, uh, it allows us to get more upstream, or as uh, Megan uh, says, uh, Marie Delga says, um, uh, certain things are off the table and we can do a deeper dive into what people's key performance indicators are. We can do a deeper dive and upskill our needs analysis. So we can really find out what it is that are, are their greatest goals and concerns. We can learn about people's injury history, their pain history, their training history. Uh, we can learn a lot more in, in, in finding out about their story. And of course, we all know that in this era of high tech medicine, uh, the history has gotten short shrift. Uh, many doctors don't even meet with patients. It's a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant that meets with patients. And the doctor won't see the patient if it's a, in the orthopedic realm uh, unless the patient is accompanied by their scan. Whatever happened to knowing the person? And so my book is called A Person-Centered Approach, A Patient-Centered Approach for this very reason, because I realized that, uh, that I was making a mistake thinking uh, that I could just assess somebody's movement patterns and find what's wrong with them. I didn't even need a history. Uh, we have very famous people that teach seminars far and wide that um, uh, are brilliant and believe the history leads to prejudice. I couldn't disagree more. I vehemently disagree with that. I think that your biography becomes your biology. And the more we can learn about the person, the greater our therapeutic alliance. Uh, the more we can mutually arrive at goals, the more we can help people uh, to uh, be patient with the process because results don't come overnight. Christian Thorberg, the great tendinopathy expert, groin injury specialist uh, from, uh, from Denmark, I believe it is, 
uh, says for most of the tendinopathies that he sees, uh, the timeline is over six months. So when we're after quick fixes, we wind up giving uh, just cough drops to people and they feel better in the moment, but have we really gotten upstream to the source of the source? So today we're here to reboot once again, uh, the high value approach to musculoskeletal prehab and rehab uh, with uh, our wonderful guest, Rachel Balkovec, who's uh, uh, recently taken on a job with the New York Yankees. And, and Rachel, I wanna ask you a quick question. Aren't you a little anxious to get started? Um. Yes and no, you know, I mean, I just, just being patient, I guess, but um, we've been communicating with the guys a lot. I'm anxious to, there's only so much you can do with hitters anyway through video because they have to be facing live pitching. So we're anxious to kind of, there's been a lot of guys who've been working on their mechanics, um, but we got to test them in a game setting where I think with pitching, it's actually a lot, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to make true adjustments when they're at home. So um, yeah, I'm anxious, but also just, it's what's going on in the world. So being patient and getting better in other ways, I guess. So you're rolling with it. And, yeah. and I know you've been hiking a lot um, and mm -hmm. uh, you were in Utah and now you're in Colorado. Is that right? Um, yeah, I was in, when they sent us home, I went to Utah for about a month and just um, now I'm headed kind of towards my family and staying in tiny little towns with no people. So that's the best way to go during this time. But <laughs> I'm I'm staying in like little tiny mountain towns and and uh, just enjoying the scenery and getting work done. Yeah, it's been actually it's been good if I'm allowed to to say that out loud. I I agree with you. I feel like the the pause button was needed for yeah. the planet, not just uh, the environment. Uh, when I say planet, but but we're um, we're seeing that. Um, in spite of our politics, if I can say that, um, that we are globally all connected. Mm -hmm. We see like yeah. the supply chain issues with testing in the United States. We see that our state governments have been pitted against each other in bidding wars for essential supplies, uh, PPE and whatnot, as well as testing reagents. Uh, and who are they buying these things from? China. And, and because uh, we're bidding against each other, 50 states, we're bidding the price up. <laughs> and who suffers? Well, states now, we see this in California, one of the wealthiest states, states now are having to decide because we have such a shortfall, because of course we have this health crisis, but we also now have an economic crisis to boot, uh, are having to decide, well, do we have to lay off police, teachers, firemen, um, sanitation workers, and the like. So we're all connected. And of course, we needed uh, a lot more transparency from China. We needed uh, more information earlier, or maybe we had it and we weren't listening. Um, uh, but uh, we're all in this together. We've seen the horror of um, uh, the mortuaries being full in Spain, in Italy, in New York City. Um, uh, in Iran. Um, this is a global pandemic, obviously, and the earth is, is, is temporarily changing. Uh, we're hearing birds. We're, 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 my son got stung by a stingray yesterday because there aren't enough people in the, in the waters. And so the, all the critters are out. <laughs> and and things, are, things are changing in other ways too which are opening our eyes to the fact that um, you know, you're seeing that there were no elective surgeries. So surgeries like, like uh, arthroscopic surgery for meniscus problems, which had been basically all but debunked, um, uh, were finally, um, we were finally constrained from being able to offer them to patients who were asking because doctors are always saying, oh, you have knee pain, let's scan you to see what's wrong. Not telling people that there's a false positive rate to the scan. Well, the scans have been off the table. People haven't been able to get scans that easily. So we saved people from that nocebo. And if people did already have a scan or were able to get a scan, 
of course, the doctors weren't able to so easily say, oh, well, if you can't live with it anymore, uh, we'll fix it uh, and offer the surgery. Think about rotator cuffs. Torn rotator cuffs fare just as well with conservative care as with surgery. Uh, torn rotator cuffs that are repaired with surgery, even if symptoms don't recur, one third of the cases re-tear asymptomatically. So did we need those nocebos? And did we need all those elective procedures? Uh, and in the space of most of, of our audience here today, um, do we always need to give corrective exercises? Or can we focus more on the environment and the task uh, and guide from a distance? Do we always need manual therapy and modalities? Um, or are we able to show people what they can do for themselves? Uh, we've, been, uh, we've been put in a position uh, where we're having to upskill. And I think one of the reasons why people from all over the globe are tuning in to, to educational content like this is A, because yes, you have the time, uh, but B, space is no bar anymore. And so we can all gather together and we can reflect about uh, things that maybe uh, we're overdue. And so something good to your point, Rachel, I'm with you. I feel that, that good will come of this. I feel that, that there, were no, there was no possibility for us to implement the best practices that we had learned about from the science. There was no possibility we were going to bridge the gap from evidence to practice, from science to the gym or the clinic uh, without uh, a jolt like this. So I see this as ultimately having a, having a, a positive um, uh, ripple for all of us as well. I don't think you should feel bad about that, Rachel. <laughs> I think it's just, it's just one of those things where um, and we shouldn't get talking on mindset because the reason why we have round two is because we talked about mindset too long last time and I, I ranted on for forever. Um, <laughs> but just, just like anything else, you know, everyone five years from a traumatic event can look back and go, wow, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. But it, the trick or the, the key is to be able to look at it in the moment and go, okay, this doesn't really feel that great, but actually like I can see the positivity and if we can just acknowledge in the moment like it doesn't really feel like great but why doesn't it feel like great it's just because it's different right it's something something in our life has been disrupted and that could be anything that could be divorce death sickness lose your business whatever it's change and so if we're not prepared for it then we we spiral yeah. um and and we're not prepared for who's prepared for, for a global pandemic not me, but, but in the moment, the trick is if you can in that moment say, okay, what actually good could come out of this? Maybe you could just start working towards that good immediately instead of having to, you know, mill over it. And then years later, you look back and go, oh, I guess that was actually really good for me. But that's easier said than done, of course. No, this is, this is a time, I think, when we all need support. And it reminds me of a study, a uh, very famous study um, reported uh, uh, years ago, but I read about it in the New Yorker magazine about children in Hawaii who had uh, grown up in a broken, broken home or with uh, alcoholism or abuse in the home, and that many of the children went on to juvenile delinquency or drug abuse or other problems, serious problems uh, as teenagers. Um, and there were outlier children, outlier children who had traits of resilience. And we think about how parenting has changed. You mentioned Angela Duckworth before, and um, you kind of gave us a two by two matrix for Angela's approach. And we think about how children for many years uh, have been giving, getting participation trophies and we've got helicopter moms and now we've got uh, uh, bulldozer parents, right? And, and, and it turns out that in this study, they found that the children who were resilient, who, did, who, who coped better and endured and became robust uh, from the, the challenges that they faced, um, were the children that had support, whether it was an uncle or an aunt or something like that, the children who had some sort of social support. So we talk in our musculoskeletal space about biopsychosocial, 
and that it's not all bio, which is why the scan isn't important and the person's story is important and we need to find out their goals and their concerns. So when these children had support, um, they avoided all those problems and many of them even thrived as a result of having that scar tissue and having that quality that you can only get from experience. So I think that this pandemic is not survival of the fittest, but maybe it's survival of the most adaptable. And we're trying to give people support so they can adapt. And I, I want to throw a question to you, Ryan. You know, you're in, along with Wuhan and maybe Lombardia, the most hardest hit area in the, in the globe. Uh, for this crisis. And one of the things I read yesterday immediately made me think about you and your reload team. Somebody was saying somewhere that uh, all of this um, online workouts, they've, they're not good. And they're um, uh, lowering the value. And um, I know there's a lot of chagrin in the training community because we've all seen over the last 10 or 15 years, thank God for CrossFit, uh, that on every corner is, is a box gym. Um, and, and we've seen that, 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 that a lot more people have access now. And there's a lot of communities that have sprung up all over the globe. This has been an amazingly positive influence. Um, and a lot of these, these small business owners are really struggling right now but there are different tactics. There are different ways of approaching this challenge. And what I've seen from the reload team is you haven't adopted a negative mindset. You haven't uh, become bitter. In fact, um, what I see is that you're offering an incredibly high quality service, which is actually something that, that has allowed you to, to stretch your environment and your reach beyond where it was before at Union Square. And, and I see that you're starting to build up a library of content that's high quality content. And, and I'm wondering why it is that in the training space, a lot of trainers and half of my audience are trainers in our, in our lab immersions um, are being weighed down by these, these negative ways of looking at this. I mean, I understand the financial issues very, very well. I'm, I, I rebooted immediately. I was worried for, for, for my uh, office expense. I pay for my office. I pay for my home. I have, I have no, but you don't want to know what my expenses are living in, in a city like Los Angeles to maintain uh, even a portion of my, of, of, of my lifestyle. My fixed expenses are through the roof. How was I going to survive? Um, but how did you make the pivot? Because I see what you're doing is you're an ambassador of how to turn a negative into a positive. I think um, we're very fortunate that we've been <clears throat> learning from you and, and staying on top of best practices from an evidence standpoint, because the pivot to, you know, training online and offering virtual services and uh, all these other things uh, stems re re really just from, uh, I think, it, I think it comes from what we thought we were going to do anyway. We had plans in the beginning of the year to, to go virtual, to offer online service, to expand our reach. But obviously COVID pushed it uh, to the forefront of the priorities. But I think first, I'm just really lucky that I have a, a really passionate team, Hunter, Gary, Joe, Andy, um, they, they want to help people. So it doesn't <clears throat> weigh us down when we can't see people. We just figure out other ways. We just like you said, pivot to the next thing. And it's, it's a problem solving thing. And, you know, where the evidence comes in is we've been learning all along that coaching is better than treating. Uh, guiding by the side is, is uh, uh, in the long run, better for clients than, than uh, giving them just what they want. So I think we've been working on it. And um, yeah, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of chatter. There's a lot of trainers who are mad at people for giving free classes and, we're, we're doing free virtual classes and we just posted something about it, how, you know, when we first started doing it, it was, it was to help people because everyone's stuck in their home. People don't have a way to work out. And um, it, it just, it was just one other thing weighing people down, but we, our passion was always in helping people get active and doing um, I think what's best for their health. So 
we kept we keep our classes free and there's a lot of pushback uh from from other trainers who are now saying hey you're 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 dumbing down the market you're diluting it because you're offering free services but like you said this is a global pandemic and uh we're all happy to um offer the classes to get people active to help our community because we need social connection we need community we need uh something more regular in our schedule and uh our team gets to practice our team gets to uh, you know, we're not uh, group people. And over the last six weeks, we've become group instructors. We've practiced, <laughs> you know, we've struggled. We asked for feedback. Um, but it's all in the, the, the thought. It was all to get better f so we can help our clients better in the future and help um, develop the skills that, you know, Rachel has been teaching us, Nick Winkleman, all, even Laura Mose, every all of the guests on here have been saying the same thing is that gui guiding people, coaching people is, is uh, where it is. And that's why I'm so happy to be on this webinar to be able to teach with you um, and share this. Well, you've been an inspiration. And, and I know that, that a place like New York, where people have been really lo locked in and sheltered, sheltered at home, uh, have people have benefited uh, immensely from that. Um, uh, my brother, my sister-in-law included. <laughs> um, uh, so people who have questions can reach out to me. My handles are here. You can catch this later also. Um, uh, when this is placed on YouTube later today or tomorrow. Um, so COVID-19 has shaken the world like nothing before in modern times. Its impact is global as it has caused the world to hit the pause button on life as we had come to know it. There are many who are working round the clock on bringing pre-COVID life back as soon as possible. But is that really desirable? So this is from a blog from a patient of mine, Ethan Penner who um, is somebody who writes op-eds for the Wall Street Journal, a financier and uh, investment strategist for many, many, many years. Um, and his, his thoughts about uh, whether we're returning to the rat race or should, or how soon, or what the world will look like or what it should look like, I think are, are fascinating. And they dovetail with other things that are starting to come out now as we start to move through these different stages of re-entry into our economies. The world is gonna be different when we come out of quarantine and our habits and how we use office space will be different. This is in an article in the New York Times. It really took the lockdown, if you will, to accelerate those trends. This was just the other day, just this week in the New York Times. So I think we're starting to, to palpate this now. Um, in Ethan's blog, he, he talks about something he calls creative destruction. This is, this, I like this. It reminds me of terms like um, um, uh, disruptive influencer, being a disruptive influencer, how to event. And like Rachel said, we couldn't have anticipated this. This is a black swan. I mean, I think in our training world, you know, Tim Gabbett talks about black swans. Prepare for, uh, prepare for the hardest passage of play you might encounter like a basketball player in the playoffs, a fellow star is injured, back-to-back -back games, then overtime, road games, things like this. You know, you're not just preparing for the average demand, but the most challenging passages of play that you could encounter. So Ethan says, quoting uh, former Chicago mayor, Ram Emanuel, when working in the Clinton administration, suggested that we ought to not let any crisis go to waste with the implication that a time of crisis presents a time to rethink things and to make some improvements. In times of crisis of old, less relevant, and perhaps even bad ideas and constructs, wither and die, leaving room for new relevant and valuable, valuable ones to emerge in their place. That's what we're witnessing right now. This is a, a, a crisis uh, which will prune certain behaviors one of the worst things would be what I saw on Monday, uh, which was a report that um, the EPA uh, was going to lower emission standards at our ports, like in Long Beach, to spur the economy. Why would we do something so, so uh, contrary to everything that we have, have witnessed and experienced over the last month or two? It just seems so, um, opposite of what of, of, of what the world is teaching us. This is not a time uh, to uh, go
go backwards on the environment. This is a time to go forwards. If we see this curve, you can see that uh, one of the risk factors for uh, COVID-19 hospitalization and death, it, besides being older, is comorbidities. It's hypertension, it's obesity. Um, and yet, when we look at, at our, our fellow uh, Americans especially, chronic disease prevalence has gone up since 1940. We've gotten sicker. It's, it's uh, a wake up for us. Modernization has not made us healthier. We are designed to move. We're eating too much and moving too little. There's evidence from national studies uh, that uh, people in their 30s and 40s may actually be in worse shape than people that same age were a generation ago. An increase in diabetes, obesity, and other chronic conditions. From Lisa Beckham a Thomas Cabot Professor of Public Policy and Epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Director of the Harvard Center for Population and Development Studies. So embrace this as a time for some creative destruction, Ethan says, to work its way through our system. We can capitalize upon this amazing opportunity for new ideas to be born and for new dreamers to emerge in leadership roles who can help to set our society on a very different and vastly superior course to the one we were previously on. Creative destruction is as natural as the earth itself. So we have yeah. all of you here for this, 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 this webinar to listen to people like Rachel. So, so Rachel, you're about to start with the New York effing Yankees, the Bronx Bombers, and you had to hit pause, but, but what is sharpening in you as you are becoming, as you're poised, poised to, to enter that, that, that realm of incredibly high level um, tradition um, in one of the most, um, uh, one of the wealthiest and most successful franchises uh, in the history of all professional sports. I love the creative destruction is as natural as the earth itself. So I just, I put up a post on my Instagram that a few days ago or something that I'm in Utah or I was in Utah and I'm in Colorado. And it's amazing to think how many millions of people flock to the mountainous areas of the country and of the world to climb and to ski and to admire, admire the scenery, but how quickly we forget that the mountains that we're standing on and, and in awe of were created by like massive cataclysmic mm -hmm. destruction that wiped out populations of animals and probably people, you know, and now however many millions of years later, we're standing on them going, oh, this is so beautiful. And it's like this beautiful metaphor for life. And like we're, we're literally just looking at these mountains like, oh wow, it's so beautiful, we take pictures, it's, so, it's breathtaking, it's even romantic. And also just brilliant to look at, um, especially in Utah, you can see the layers of rock very clearly when you look at the mountains. And like that happened because the earth opened up and swallowed up like populations of, of species. <laughs> so you see these layers of rock and it's just this metaphor for life that these layers have been laid down over the years. And it's incredible to think that that was from massive destruction. So I love creative destruction is as natural as the earth itself. And it truly is like some of the most beautiful structures that we are in awe of today are actually from destruction of the earth. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. And also like, just, just like you mentioned, Craig is, you know, there's a period of time, just like everyone else, there's a period of time when, when it was first happening and like, going down, you know, we were all sent home from spring training. Like this, this was my first spring training with the Yankees. I was there for six weeks and we were all sent home. And, and there was this period of like, maybe for me personally, like a half of a day, like, am I going to have a job? Do we, you know, what are the players going to do? Just like the worries. But I think the only difference between me and anyone else, like I, I'm, I think to myself, I have these worries of, of what's going to go on. But the only difference between me and anyone else is that like, well, a couple of things probably, but, <laughs> but, very quickly, like my turnaround from worry and and uh, stress about a, a chaotic situation, that time is probably lower than other people for a couple of reasons, just a mindset that I've like, well, just the main reason is really I've practiced this mindset both in my physical training and like 
my life, just how I operate in my life is that I'm able to handle, um, I'm more flexible maybe than other people. And that's like in a very literal sense, um, in, my, in the way that I train and, and how I view physical training, but also just like how I live my life. You know, I don't, I don't have a lot of things. So I was able to just throw my stuff in my car and go to Utah. Um, I don't have kids or pets, so I get it. If you got kids or you got a house or whatever, but, um, the way that I live my life, hopefully is so that I'm, I'll use, you know, anti-fragile is a, is a term that I use often. Like that's how I live my life, but also how, I, how I view training should be as well. Um, and I, I think we might get to, we, we might get to arm care at some point in this conversation. It's coming. I'm, I'm happy. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> arm care. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to read something that you that you said. Uh, I once bought into the idea that overhead athletes should stay away from intense um, uh, upper body lifting, and that arm care meant a few band exercises in the training room. And we've all seen it—a a few more band exercises against the fence. Uh, my thoughts on this complex topic have radically changed. The body is a system, and the use of the term arm care implies that you can isolate one part of the body uh, and should be exam this idea should be examined more closely so there's so much packed into this uh, I want to talk with you about this uh, for a couple minutes um, share with us uh, what you were thinking about when you wrote this and 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 how that uh, positions you in major league baseball as a, as an outlier <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, sometimes I think if I didn't write these things, I'd be more well liked in the community, but who, who, that's no fun. Um, I don't, I just don't simply put, I just do not believe in arm care. And I actually, I actually think just using the term arm care is toxic to our athletes mindset in regard to how they care for their body. So like the simple, if we want to talk about arm care, okay, fine. I believe that you can care for your shoulder in certain ways or even any joint, you know, of course, but like. But just saying that the term arm care puts it in our athletes' minds. Hey, okay, go do your arm care. It puts it in their minds that you can actually just care for your arm. You can isolate that part of the body. You can go in the, the training room or whatever and do your band exercises, and now you're caring for your arm. But the irony in, in that is that, um, and also, by the way, in the chat, I want to know, we've got 170 people on here. If you know the origin of, of arm care and specifically in baseball, please put it in the chat. I've asked that question to so many people and no one can actually answer it. But here, I'll give you my theory on it is that, you know, athletic training is a much older profession than strength and conditioning. And so athletic training in professional baseball was around well, well before there were strength coaches around. And so there was no organized strength training. And so of course the athletic trainer's solution, which I'm, it's really to no fault of their own because they have their own job to do. Their solution was, okay, well, we're not doing weightlifting. So let's, let's at least throw some exercises in there to strengthen the shoulder. Um, who, who put something in the chat? I, I read it. Oh yeah. From Babe Ruth when he was eating hot dogs on the sideline. That's arm care. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so <laughs> athletic trainers said, okay, well, well, how are we going to, how are we going to pr protect the shoulder joint? Well, we're going to do arm care. And so these arm strengthening exercises probably came about and then we got strength and conditioning into professional baseball. Really realistically, like, you know, there were a couple, of course, and like Alejo, who, who all of us know on this call, of course, was around. He's been around for decades. But really how it is today, organized weight training, how it is today, not until like 15-ish years ago and maybe even 10 years ago. So this is like actually extremely recent. So now we have players going in the weight room, doing pull-ups, presses, overhead press, doing all of this this work involving the shoulder and then we still have them doing arm care which is just radically strange to me but it's just because it's an it's an ancient concept that has stayed around even though we have weight training and different modalities now that we're using that are caring for the shoulder however I don't I just would like to abolish literally abolish the term arm care because again of the mindset that it puts both our practitioners strength coaches and most importantly our athletes it gives them a mindset of like, okay, I can actually protect my arm by doing these band exercises, which is ludicrous when you think about it. And also we've, I think as a community, we're getting away from single joint exercises or just, you know, low intensity exercises, unless of course it's a 
injury situation immediately post surgery, something like that. We're obviously talking about a different thing here with sports performance, but we have gotten away from single joint exercises, but yet we're like, oh, hamstring curls on a machine. That's, that's not for sports performance, right? We, we know that, but then we still have them going into the athletic training room and doing this. And we're calling yeah. that, we're saying that is actually protecting their shoulder from the extreme forces they're experiencing when they're throwing a ball. That's, that's, it's silly to think about. So I think that's, you know, when I wrote that, that's kind of what I was thinking about is we need to just stop saying that word, the, that phrase altogether and stop thinking like that because body is a system. The lat attaches to the hip, the, the pelvis. Okay. Right. Runs over the scapula and, and attaches to the humerus. So if your pelvis is out of position, then your arm's going to be fucked up too. So if you're, if you're not like arm care is pelvic positioning, but we still are saying, we're still telling our athletes, we're sending the message to them that they can go into a training room and do this or do this with some bands. And I'm simplifying it, of course, there's other things. And I know that practitioners are, we're talking about breathing, we're talking about these things, but it's still very pervasive. And I think the athletes in their mind, if I said, how do you care for your arm? A lot of them would probably say, it's from this. They would say that even though they might be doing other things that, that strength, strength and conditioning, athletic trainers, physical therapists are having them do. And the, the practitioners might know that they're caring for their arm in other ways. But if you ask the athletes, they would say, Oh, it's when I do, you know, this, these band exercises, I really think that they would say that. And I think that's probably one of the biggest problems. Mm. Well, you, you highlight how the whole body is, is a system or a unit. And it's complex, and it reminds me of um, Lorena Torres, who talks about injury prediction um, and how challenging it is because of all this complexity. There are so many variables here, and how anybody could think they could just isolate something out um, like uh, you know low intensity single joint exercises, and and call that arm care that to your point it's toxic because it's giving the athlete the wrong idea we have to leave no stone unturned obviously they know throwing is a symphony it's a kinetic swirl and and generating this incredible force this power um uh requires that 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 there are efficiencies up and down the kinetic chain i i recall a study by jacqueline perry uh, USC in the 1960s that I that I came across, where she studied Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale with the Dodgers, and reported from her biomechanical analysis that they generated only about seven or eight percent of the power in throwing a baseball with their arm. So it's a whip. <laughs> um, so you know, Lorena here is saying that they they tried. Uh, they tried injury prediction, uh, going from screening to prediction to intervention, um, spent a lot of money. Um, it, the complexity is just overwhelming. And people that think that they can isolate out these things and have cracked the code, um, we're dealing with complex systems. We're dealing with chaos. Um, at some point, we might find uh, things that are more or less valuable, but it's going to have to be on an uh, uh, individual basis. Uh, and empirical at this point. Um, injury is mu very multifactorial, something that came out with, with uh, 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 Paola Silva uh, last Sunday. Um, all of the variability, all the influences, all the complexity, uh, the idea that things are in a one-to-one -one Cartesian linear relationship. Um, um, you know, even if I look at something um, like PRI, which is very popular in Major League Baseball. Um, and I use PRI concepts. Um, and it's important to know that the diaphragmatic cura is three and a half times thicker on the right than the left. And, and why that is, because uh, the liver is on the right. And so there's this extra weight there that has to be supported. So uh, the anterior ribs on the left may uh, be lifted up relative to the right and that this is a common thing but what effect does that have on the scapula what effect does that have on the hip um, we want to know our anatomy obviously um, um, but then to think uh, that we're going to make these mono interventions uh, and they're going to have this sort of cascade uh, and that we don't need to do higher load higher intensity things to build up robustness if if we go to low load things 
to your point, Rachel, um, uh, don't, do, are, are you afraid uh, that the athlete who goes to the low load uh, exercises uh, somehow loses sight of the value of the higher intensities to build robustness? Yeah, 100%. I think it's, a, it's an easy cop out for both practitioners and for the athletes then. I think it's mostly on the practitioners because we're in charge of practice design. We're in charge of designing these, these training sessions. Um, but then the athletes will adopt that easily. And so it's, it's, I don't even want to put it on the athletes. It's on us to make it difficult. And it's, it's also on us to promote that to the athletes, especially because, <laughs> oh, Craig, you are, it is, this is Craig's comedy hour, I swear. Uh, yeah, just pull up. yeah, so, so I mean, look, look, that's great. Go back to that slide. Go back to that slide. This is, this is great. I go to Santa Monica Pier and look at like this woman who's just, Effortlessly, effortlessly swinging from the rings. And I cannot name a single player that I know that, that would be able to do that. But more importantly, they would look at that with fear. They wouldn't want to do that because they would be fearful of doing it, which, which is not their fault. This is a systemic issue of practitioners and the way that we talk to our athletes, the way that we say, this is arm care, this isn't arm care, the way that we say, don't do overhead, you know, don't do overhead presses, don't do pull-ups, which look, I understand sometimes there are limitations in the joint. There's outliers for everything. So we're not talking about them right now. I'm talking about from the inception of their training, when they're doing sports performance training, when they're 14 to 16, we do not need to discourage 14 year olds from doing overhead exercises or even doing pull-ups, hopefully, because hopefully at 14, they still have all of the range of motion that they need that they need the problem is of course when they get to be 30 years old and they're a veteran and they haven't done any of this stuff for their 12-year professional career of course you can't do it with them because they're they are fragile at that point or if you do do it you can do it in a way where you you build them up very slowly which i firmly believe in and even in 2018 when i was with the astros in double a so we're talking about some of the oldest players in the organization i was having them do very simple things like a half kneeling overhead dumbbell press, you know, and only make, making sure that they go to um, the point of range of motion where they can still maintain a good stacked position with their trunk and their pelvis. So there's certain things you can do, or I was having them do accumulate 30 seconds of hanging from a bar. Think about this. Look at this woman who's just like flying through the air effortlessly from the rings. She's not stronger in the typical sense probably than the athletes that I work with, but her joints are more robust and more able to handle something. I would love for our pitchers to be able to do something like that. Is it appropriate for most of them in this moment? No, because they haven't trained like that their entire life. So, I, I mean, I would have the players accumulate 30 seconds of hanging from a bar and some of them couldn't even hang from a bar for 30 seconds, but yet they're gonna go out and pitch and, and impose thousands of, of newtons of, of force into their shoulder and elbow joint. And we say that, oh, that's dangerous to have them train like this. It's really counterintuitive, and I think it's. It, I think more than anything, it's fear-based. Again, that from the practitioner's end, it's fear-based from our end, and then we impose that fear onto the athlete and say, "Oh, that's not safe for you." And then the athletes go around and they say, "Yeah, I don't do a lot of overhead training because you know it's not good because I'm a baseball player." Like I will hear that repeatedly from athletes, but they didn't get that idea out of nowhere. They got it from what we're what information we're feeding them. And we see we see the same thing with like a back squat. <laughs> So you know, don't bench press, don't back squat. Um, I have many, many female patients who um, are afraid of compression in squats. Um, and they've been made to think that they're fragile uh, because they may have been told that they have what's called a spondy, a spondylolisthesis, which is uh, incredibly common in asymptomatic people. Um, and women, if they don't load their spinal column are prone to developing osteoporosis. So by managing them away from load, we're, we are actually making them fragile. And how did we get to that? Because we made them feel fragile. We, we gave them nocebos. Um, it, it's, it's, it's sad that basic tenets of strength and conditioning that Bob Alejo, uh, for instance, um, spoke about at Exos are, are ignored as we all kind of manage people away from load and create this sort of rehab purgatory. Um, Tim DeFrancesco talks a lot about how we're creating, uh, uh, we're creating fragility um, 
by always going to the manual therapy, by going to the scan, by going to the single joint low load exercises uh, or overemphasizing the correctives. None of these things are bad. Um, I think it yeah. would be a mistake for anybody to think that we're saying that any of these things are inappropriate. It's right person, right intervention, right time. And that, that's what I'm hearing you say also, Rachel. Um, I want to throw this out there. The you, you, leave you gave a, nowhere sometimes. Go ahead. No, no. What were you saying? Just like the over, it's like, I don't want to make, I don't want to say, and, and you're going to see in this video, it's like we're doing breathing exercises here. So I, I believe firmly in doing those things, but it should only be, it's with an end goal in mind. I don't like to hear people say, oh, I've been doing these correctives for the past year, you know, and it's like, if you've been doing those correctives for the past year, you haven't been doing them right, or you've been doing the wrong correctives. So the correctives should be with a goal in mind and not to continue doing corrective exercise for the rest of your life. However, there's maintenance. And I mean, even as I sit here, just so we all know, I'm moving around a lot. I did a pretty intensive, like just a pretty intensive workout yesterday for a couple of hours. And I also threw a baseball for 45 minutes or so and got couple hundred reps throwing a baseball doing batting practice and so I feel fine but I'm just you know this is arm care I'm just I'm moving around and, and something so simple as I'm sitting down right now where I would rather be standing and so like simple things like that um, that we do in maintenance care all day long can be corrective exercise I don't believe in the term arm care and I also don't even really believe in the term corrective exercise because I think that all exercises can be corrective and not actually all movements, all things in your day can be corrective or not corrective, depending on what you're, how you're doing them. For example, I think Craig's about to play this video about breathing. Or whatever else you have is actually a little bit ludicrous. So we are getting strong in the weight room. We're already doing arm care. Doing a pull-up is arm care. That's strengthening your arm. Doing a military press, for God's sake, that is arm care. You're doing a snatch is arm care. Doing strengthening your shoulders and your arms is, is obviously very important. But then to say arm care again, I just want to follow up that term of momentum that I'm thinking about. To say strengthening arm care when there's been so many variables, so please the fact that when we step into the training room or into the clinic and we do band work with tubing, that's actually what's saving the arm. So we're alluding to that. I would like to abolish the term arm care and just talk about body care, holistic. Holistic care of the entire body to care for the extremities. Any questions? So, go ahead. I don't, I don't know if he's. I don't know if he's going to play this, but so in that in the clip. Yeah, I do. I do have the breathing later. Okay. All right. Well, we can. You can keep going then on your rant. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to give a couple of of examples here of how we work through the kinetic chain um, when uh, normalizing function or um, uh, reducing sensitivity uh, in a single joint. Um, Dr. Levitt always taught us, he who treats the site of symptoms is lost. And so this sort of holistic mindset that Rachel's talking about, uh, I think most of the people here in our room, uh, in this webinar, they're aware of this type of thinking. Um, and I just want to give a couple of ideas. So this is a patient of mine uh, who had uh, shoulder issues. You can see the difference in thoracic rotation. So I screened his thoracic rotation. On the, on the right, uh, you can see he has 90 degrees. On the left, he has about half of that. And so the, this is uh, one way of intervening that opened up the anterior line on the left-hand side uh, and then in the bottom corner on the left, you see the post-intervention uh, empirical um, uh, outcome where now his left thoracic rotation was improved. Go for it, Rhino. Reset, reset. Take the heart easy. Are you feeling it, Ryan? Is it working? Oh, oh, right, right. right or left? Right, right. So we're opening up that uh, left anterior line, uh, mobilizing that. Um, and obviously he's using his right glute. Uh, he's facilitating and activating the right glute. Here's another example of whole body training from the great coach uh, Lackey, Lack Lackland Wilmot, works with a lot of rugby athletes in, in Sydney. Um, 
And you'll, it's sort of a variation on something that Pavel Satsalin has taught uh, for getting the torso nice and stiff uh, into a whole body plank uh, to stabilize uh, through the upper quarter kinetic chain. This is one of my absolutely favorite drills to get the athlete to learn how important the torso is to the shoulder girdle. And we can even do this technique from the heels, uh, something I learned from uh, Coach Carmen Bott in Vancouver. We're just teaching that person how to dial in the whole body stiffness. And we're aware of many different examples uh, from some closed chain training, uh, such as uh, the Gracie Jiu Jitsu uh, Academy teaches uh, in the sit through. And here's a group in, uh, in Seoul practicing the sit through. Stay high, go slow. Stay high. So we're, we're cueing the tempo and the Stay external cue yes. uh, to get the hip extension. We also want that lat Up to fire. So we yes. want the trunk lifted. So we're packing the shoulder. Higher, Raymond. That's it. Slower, 25 year old. Child, up, higher, higher, higher. Yes. And here's an example of uh, uh, just using our environment uh, for the rehabilitation of the locomotor system. Uh, this is uh, a woman who um, has done a lot of bodybuilding. Uh, she's also a former Kona triathlete, uh, qualifier for uh, the Tour de France uh, 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 bicycle race, um, and um, now uh, entering a phase of her life uh, where there are some musculoskeletal issues in particular in her shoulder girdles that have begun to give her some issues that we're, that we're finding workarounds for. Well, I tell you the great things about the tree. Because each tree ha is, have a different shape. So this is very thick. When you grab a bar, it's very narrow. So you only have that clip. So there are certain parts in your hands, actually they don't get work. By working with branches, with different shape of tree, it's amazing because it really makes you a whole completely a strong person. So there is a lot of people, they're in the gym lifting a lot of weight, and as soon as you put them to go and grab a tree, they can't, they don't understand how to really work because they never be able to use that part of their hands. But I can see here how thick this is. I have to hold this branch differently that if I hold it apart. So proprioceptively, um, the variability that the system has to be able to uh, uh, problem solve when dealing with the natural environment uh, is something Paula Silva talked a lot about last week. You know, we can't anticipate uh, all the challenges that will, that will occur in front of an athlete. Um, and we're always concerned about the transferability of what we do in the gym to the sport. Uh, and so having uh, different ideas about different tasks and being creative and allowing people to problem solve, uh, for me, is, is uh, a no-brainer. Uh, in rehabilitation. And we want to gamify things as much as possible. There's nothing better uh, than, than the outdoors for this. Um, Rachel, what sort of uh, thoughts do you ha have when you see my patient Marisol 
talking about her hands like that. I love this. <laughs> I love it. Just, and I know, I don't know how much you're going to show about this, but also um, I do a lot of, I incorporate like a lot of, I guess, gymnastics, even though I'm not a gymnast and it's not real gymnastics training, um, but really just like hanging rings, climbing, uh, putting your hands on the ground, I'm pr like practicing handstands and, and, um, you know, I, I try to practice static hand, handstand, but also walking and like the, the amount of uh, stress that puts on your shoulders and having to get out of those positions um, and create and uh, solve problems physically, I think is, is one of the most potent things that you can do. And uh, you touched on this at the very beginning of the webinar, Craig, but you have to basically train for the worst case scenario. And I think at best we're training for like an ideal scenario but really we might not even be training for the ideal scenario of just the minimal amount of stress that you might encounter in a in a game or a scenario or a um in a like competition setting so training for the worst case scenario means that you have to put your body in weird positions and you also have to stress your body so a, another hot topic and also someone put something in the question and answer i want to answer here in a second here um another like hot topic in baseball or just in in high high level sport performance is you know we don't who cares if baseball players are in shape and they don't need to do a lot of conditioning and they don't need need to do conditioning for uh to do their to actually perform especially pitchers is kind of a hot topic and like i also don't believe in this and i know that's ex that's highly highly controversial i don't believe in that either and it's not that i'm saying that pitchers need to run miles to be a good pitcher to actually throw the ball hard and perform. However, especially in professional baseball, when you're looking at 150 games in a row, don't we believe that capillary density is important? Don't we believe that mitochondrial count is important? Don't we believe that simply the ability to recover in between games, day to day, in between pitches, in between innings, that ability to recover? And, and the other argument is like, of course you don't, you do not need to run triathlons to do that. Um, but I think that we're, we're not even doing the bare minimum in that. And we're saying, oh, pitchers shouldn't run long distance because that will be, you know, that will decrease their, their power output. Well, again, again, highly controversial. So I'm sure I'll get some, somebody will be talking about me after this webinar in a bad light, but that's fine. Thank God for, <laughs> thank God for CrossFit. And I'll, I'll wait if anyone wants to put in the chat that that's crazy. Thank God for CrossFit because what CrossFit has shown us and we're looking at, uh, Tia Toomey Claire, uh, Tia Claire Toomey, I think is actually her, her real name is like, she is the fittest woman on earth three years in a row. And she also has won a gold medal in an international weightlifting competition. So anyone that says that, says that training for cardiovascular endurance or, or aerobic capacity is going to decrease your power output to the point where you can't throw a ball as fast. Again, it's another cop out. It's a way for, especially our athletes to say, well, I don't need to be, I don't need to be in cardiovascular shape or I don't need to have aerobic capacity to throw a ball hard. And in fact, you do not. And that's been proven time and time and time again by all of the athletes that we, that we see are not very fit at the high level of professional baseball and other, other sports. I'm just using baseball because it's easy for me, but um, we see athletes that are not in the best shape and, and not, do not have the best aerobic capacity and they're performing at a high level. But how long can you sustain that? What kind of longevity does that really get you? And there are outliers. So before anyone says Bartolo Colon, before anyone says that Babe Ruth was overweight, I don't want to hear it. There are outliers, of course. <laughs> but for the general person, for the general person who who does need that extra edge, absolutely, you should be in excellent cardiovascular shape, not necessarily to throw a ball hard or to hit it far, not necessarily for that. But when you compile all of those things over the course of a season, and when you're taking those long road trips, you're flying across the country, you're driving 12 hours overnight in a bus, and you're expecting your body to recover properly for the next day to prevent injury, soft tissue damage, to prevent, um, to prevent actual joint tissue uh, being destructed, then, then you should really take a closer look at what that does for you from a recovery standpoint, not necessarily from the acute performance standpoint. So all that was coming from this woman climbing a tree here. Um, but just to say that not only like putting your joint in a, in a weird position or just a different, not weird, but just different, like climbing a tree is going to put your body in a different position than doing a bench press. Doing a bench press is very linear and controlled. Doing a pull up is very linear and controlled. Climbing a tree like this is something that you would have to, you have to physically solve that problem. So doing handstand, walking on your hands, doing different close chain exercises that are, 
that are going to require you, you to be in different positions at different times, I think is vital. And on top of that, when your body is ready for it, when you've done the low level problem solving physically, you should add stress to that. You should train for the worst case scenario in your sport or even beyond that. So I'll, uh, also there's a, there's a question in the, um, in the Q and A, it says, it says, Hey, Rachel, when you speak about how arm care has shied away from heavy weight training, what do you think of pitchers training? Uh, like your new colleague, Eric Cressy has been implementing for some time now, a lot of dynamic power moves, but no huge weights. As far as I can tell, first of all, I, I do want to say, I think that's, I think that's a little bit simplified and I think that's actually false. Eric has a huge background in powerlifting. And he does believe in lifting heavy weight. However, I also want to clarify, I'm not talking the, about arm care being heavy weight training. Yeah, that could be a part of it. That can be a, a part of doing it. But that, that's a, again, that's a section of it. Whereas I'm, now I'm talking more about like robust training and varying the training to prepare the arm for it. And it doesn't have to involve weight, heavy weight training. But I do think that that's a, an important component, especially at the lower levels maybe as guys get older or players get older that's not as necessary if they've already developed the foundation of strength to begin with if they haven't then absolutely i think that's important and i, I do think i i'm almost positive i don't want to speak for, i'm not speaking for eric but i'm almost positive that eric would agree with that that you you do have to have a foundation of strength it's kind of i think he even says like i'm paraphrasing but that's what gets you in the door and then there's a lot of other things on top of that um, and obviously dynamic power moves are, are some of those. So um, great, great question. It was anonymous, but great question from whoever asked that. So we're going to talk a little bit about lifting. And, and uh, what I love so much is that we're all for the correctives. Um, we're all for like what Dan Paff and his team does at Altus with the Trinity, where there's the, the hands-on work to help with uh, to help the athlete, to grease the gear, et cetera. Um, uh, and we're combining both the intensity that you can get in the weight room to build robustness and, and load tolerance uh, with the variability of the, the rings and, and, yeah. and things in nature. So it's not one thing or the other. As far as lifting, I love this that, that, you, that you said on Twitter. If people in academia lifted heavy weight and people who lifted heavy weight read scientific literature, the world would be a better place. I just love that. And here you are. I mean, here is variable. You're lifting something linear, but, but you don't have the normal ground. Of course, it's a different context or environment. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, back to the comment about uh, in Major League Baseball and the tendency to avoid overhead lifting or rings and things like that. I think you made just the most um, uh, 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 powerful point before when you said the word arm health is toxic because it probably isn't that the strength coaches uh, don't want the baseball pitchers to be doing overhead lifting. It's probably that the strength coach is trapped by the terminology arm health and all the bands and all the other things. And so uh, the athlete is sort of uh, uh, less secure pushing heavy. Yep. And then the strength coach is serving the athlete and then, and then can only push them so far. Instead of the athlete being eager and then the strength coaching go, going, okay, I'm going to train you. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's oh, a self-perpetuating cool. loop. It's so huge. It's like, you actually ask yourself, like, how much, I mean, as a strength coach, and by the way, this is in part why I'm no longer a strength coach is because I basically was looking at myself going, how much of what I'm actually doing with the athletes is because it's what I actually believe is best for them. And how much of it is because of all the limitations that have been placed on me. And realistically, especially when you work in a professional sports setting, there's so many limitations. Some of those come from you know, if you're the strength coach, some of it's from the athletic trainers, the physical therapists, sometimes it's from 
the farm director, you know, the farm, I, at one point in my career, a farm director who, for those of you who don't understand, like the baseball structure is basically the, the administrative boss who oversees all of the minor leagues, who has nothing to do with on-field performance or anything like that, nothing to do with physical performance, called me and he said, you know, I think we're going to give the guys three weeks off, middle of season, middle of the season. So he was, he was putting a limitation on me. And so I've got limitations from athletic trainers, physical therapists, farm director, and also the athletes who have their own preconceived notions who say, I'm not going to bench press based off of what they learned. And again, there are outliers. Again, there are people who shouldn't bench press, who shouldn't back squat in the moment or who, I mean, there's plenty of those, but we're talking about the people who don't have those restrictions. And so there were so many restrictions placed on me that basically I was like thinking to myself, I'm not even doing what I actually believe to be best for the athlete, which is, is really tough. And I think a lot of us on this call have probably been in a situation like that if you've ever worked in any kind of sport um so i and i would like to say also like i do olympic lifting um because i like to do olympic lifting it's really not because i believe that it's the best thing for everyone however again i don't i don't like the dogma against olympic lifting that's out there so i try to put it out there as much as i can just so that people see like you know i i throw a ball first of all i was a softball player through college and now currently i throw a ball a lot every single day actually <laughs> and I'm still doing it I'm still doing the overhead lifting that I was doing before and if anything maybe even more because you're trying to impress upon you're trying to uh, get upper rotation of the scapula in this position which is incredibly important as you go through a throwing motion that that scapula has the range of motion that it needs to support that so you're not getting power or I should say you're not getting round, range of motion from other areas in your body I'm not even sure if that's what I was supposed to talk about here but I just went on a rant so that, Craig, you're a, you're, a master, you're a master at creating that master <laughs> I, I love that so getting you to talk about the subtle kind of motor control issues of like the uh, uh you know we hear about the uh, uh scapular dyskinesis and things like that and and you're suggesting that the overhead lifting gets upstream and requires that the scapula rotate in the correct way so the load is a stimulus that causes the rewiring or else you're not going to be able to press that weight you're not going to be able to generate that power also you the thing that you said to begin this was like i in the sexual video like the weights were sinking down the ground every time i dropped them and so i was actually doing like deficit power cleans by the time it was done there so you can see the weights are like in the ground mm -hmm. and, and and like normally I've been challenging myself lately to like it doesn't have to be perfect you know I've been carrying around this barbell and these weights around the country and I don't always have even ground or even the cement that I'm on is at a is at a you know uh, decline and I, one of a, a coach that I that I trained with not too long ago we were outside we were on like a bit of a driveway and it was on a tilt and he goes he goes, why don't you put that in the street so your feet are even? And I was like, because, I, because I'm not going to die and I want to train my body to, to, it's fine. Like, it's not super heavy weight. I'm not maxing out. So I'll just be on a little bit of decline. And then I switch and I do it the other way. So now I'm tilted this way and I have to find that balance. Of course, I wasn't doing a maximal load. Like, I might want to, you know, be on level ground if I was doing that. But but actually, do I? You know, like, what's the big fucking deal? We're always trying to make this perfect environment to train in. And I've been challenging myself, especially because, because I've been traveling around the country and being in different environments. As you see here, I'm in a pine forest. I'm, I'm in the mountains now, so I've got super high elevation. It's not perfect. I, I, I've been enjoying just going, oh, okay, I actually don't have to have perfectly even rings on a perfect set up and perfectly even ground can i handstand walk when i have to like you know there's cracks in the ground and the pavement's uneven i enjoy like these again physical i guess jigsaw puzzles that you have to solve that we never do we always train in this perfect environment which i think is putting us at a as a at a disadvantage i want to show you marisol again here you'll love this love right it now. yeah love it how you work with it <laughs> There we go. So that's a good squat. Now hinge, deadlift. And she's barefoot in the dirt. I love yeah. it. Feel your hamstrings at all? Yes. Oh, perfect. Good. Two more. I think you're so, good. Keep going. I think we can do a couple more. What do you think? Yeah. It looks great. One more. 
Okay, perfect. Oh. A little variety. Carries, sumo squats, deadlifts. Those were like Romanian. I want to do a couple uh, stiff-legged deadlifts. So not so deep. All right. Okay. Not so deep. Not so much knee knee motion. But shake everything off first. You know, like the difference between lifting a barbell like um, versus this, which is there are other benefits. Well, one of them is you're holding it in your skin. So this, this is kind of my skin. It's telling me that it's weak, you know? It's really weak because I'm feeling it. I should have a very strong layer here. I don't look just by lifting that. It means that I'm super, you know. Well, you're human. You don't have hide. No, but when you're in, in, in you were supposed to. You be, have sweat glands. You're supposed to be in an age of lifting rocks, not lifting weights. Yeah. So I created a very <laughs> strong yeah, you're layer. Funny. You're all supposed to be doing lifting things, objects, no weights. Shake it off again. Shake everything off. One at a time. One at a time. One. Switch. Get the water off. Uh, one leg. Okay. So stiff-legged deadlifts now. Three or four. So I'm always learning from my, my patients. And I was just reading yesterday... Uh, about if they bring Major League Baseball back, one plan is to have the teams in Arizona. And that uh, the heat is one issue, but another issue is the lack of humidity. And there are, are, are many pitchers, supposedly, I'm not an expert, who uh, use the humidity for gripping the ball to throw certain breaking pitches. And... Um, you can see she's talking about her skin and we think about baseball pitchers. A lot of pitchers will get a blister or something. Um, training with variability. I know Roger Clemens used to have the rice and put his arm in and in a bucket of rice and then pull up scoops of, of rice. Um, there's so many options that people have for training. Why we think about things one way, why we limit ourselves uh, it's, it is toxic. We, we, we need variability. And, and for anybody who wasn't here last week, last Sunday, Paula Silva's uh, discussion on this was absolutely passionate and inspiring about the importance uh, of variability. And I think one of the things that we're, we're moving towards is more and more uh, play, uh, the, the use of the natural environment, um, uh, obviously competition is good, building in failure tolerance, and then people have a sense of accomplishment, uh, all of the gamification. Um, we shouldn't limit ourselves or restrict ourselves. And I think, Rachel, what you're talking about is that, that, that in certain sports, um, there's so much pressure uh, that it's, it's intimidating to be a disruptive influence. Uh, your mm -hmm. job is more secure if you adhere to the status quo um, but to be a really re revolutionary, um, you have to take a couple of risks, I guess. I don't know. Well, and so actually, so Shelby Miller asked the question, what are some of your other hot takes on poor language or approaches that rehab professionals take? Um, love your thoughts on the idea of arm care. What can we be doing better to better support and facilitate what you and other coaches do once they ret return to sport? I think, and, and I've talked, this is more mindset, but it relates to you know, even this video here where she shows the arms and her arms are kind of scratched up. I recently went on a hike and uh, took a wrong turn with a friend. And it's amazing. Like it was, I, as I was hiking, um, I was kind of regretting it, but kind of not because we ended up like literally climbing on our hands and knees up this, up this uh, kind of mountainside. And, and it was a lot of loose rocks. So you had to really think, you know, when you go on a hike and there's a trail, you don't really have to think that much. You just follow the trail. And sometimes you just, you follow the person in front of you. So you don't have to think that much. But when we were doing this, we like literally, I had to grab onto roots and I would have to pull to see if the root would actually support my body weight. And then sometimes it would snap. So you're having to like, basically again, solve these physical jigsaw puzzles. And it's more dangerous, but it actually is such a better, it's a better way to train. And we ended up getting some scratches and whatnot, but it's just, 
a, another reminder of like how how fragile we are as people in the society and like i couldn't even find this hill we, we could not i would share a video but we don't really have a lot because it was too treacherous for us to even document we were like wow this is insane we ended up like sliding down the loose rock on our butts you know and and tearing our pants up it was it was phenomenal but as i'm going through this the way that my mind works as a coach going back to your question shelby is like this is this is how we should prepare ourselves for sport we shouldn't have the the walking trail our training right now is a walking trail that has no elevation and it's a set path so you might have to look at the ground to make sure you don't trip on rocks and that's it but if you're like if you are trying to find something that's going to support your body weight or you're trying to find the right the right hand uh the right uh place for your hand to go or the right place for your foot to go that you have to actually think and you have to put your body in weird situations that it's not used to so going back to like what are what are some poor language and approaches that i think we should we could do better you asked about rehab professionals but i think it's it's strength and conditioning it's anyone who's caring for an athlete is so many times we hear we hear yeah, we don't really want you to do that because we don't want you to get hurt. So what do you think that does to the athlete automatically? Yeah, we don't, get you, we don't want you to get hurt. I will never say that, never in my life will I ever say that to an athlete because it automatically puts in their mind, if I do this, I will get hurt. And so whatever exercise that is, like if, if, you're, an, uh, if you're letting your athlete, if your athlete's coming back from a rehab situation, uh, Craig, you're, you're an instigator, Craig. Everything you put up there, is, I love it controversial so as a rehab professional or a strength and conditioning professional i just will never say oh don't do that it's going to get you hurt because then automatically the athlete goes and goes on and says to the next person oh yeah that exercise is not good for me i i, I don't want to get hurt if i do that so it's really to your point and to your question shelby is like sometimes literally the verbiage the language that we're using when we're cautioning athletes makes them more fragile because they're less likely to do it in the future, even if it is something that they could do. They're, they're not going to do it because we said they couldn't do it. And I think, I think, Rachel, one of the things that I see all the time is this, uh, uh, this fragilista mindset. The person becomes fragilista because we send out that vibe. We're managing them away from load. And we're telling them everything has to be perfect. Oh, don't do this, don't do that. All this negative coaching. Yet it's inevitable that people are going to um, uh, push themselves to their edge, and then the quality is going to get uh, is going to get wobbly. I was listening to a podcast today. I want to share a quote. Um, this is from Paul Reddy. Works with a lot of uh, uh, youth athletes. Uh, has done screening on pre-pubertal athletes and, and done assessments of different jump tests on uh, young athletes at different stages of maturation to see uh, when you can really expect uh, to train certain skills. And he says, are you comfortable with your athletes feeling uncomfortable? Are you challenging their movements? If they can perform every movement absolutely perfectly, are they learning? Are you challenging their system to develop more robust and adaptable movement patterns? So anybody who's interested, I'll send you the link to the podcast with Paul Reddy where he describes this. But I, to me, this is sort of where the rubber hits the road is this idea that uh, we don't want to overcorrect. There's nothing wrong with dying bugs and bird dogs, uh, but they can only take you uh, so far. And we have to find that flow where uh, our, our client, our patient, our athlete uh, is going to have adaptation. We have to not do too little too late and not do too much too soon. Um, and Rachel's giving us a lot of examples of, of how to train robustness and gives us a window to the, to the idea that, that lifting is not dangerous. In fact, lifting is actually uh, going to help people. So it takes us back sort of to square one. One of our big themes is guiding by the side. And the difference between being the, the super, super smart person that has all the answers and knows which are the right exercises uh, and cor can correct everything, um, this Batman role 
is, I think, very dangerous. We should let people play in the mud, which, which is something I got, Rachel, from Greg Glassman, um, uh, the founder of CrossFit, that, that uh, uh, where you learn is where there's that, that struggle. And it ties in with what you talked to us about last time, about failure tolerance and building the culture in your athletes so that they all share together these victories. Uh, so it's very important that we start to move that man role in all of our sessions and in our, in our community and our cultures uh, to put the person or the athlete or the patient in the leading role. Uh, and therefore we're the conductor, we're the architect, we're the designer of the, of the environment where they get to problem solve. So without going into to too much detail here, um, this is another one I've seen on, your, um, on one of your feeds where you're showing this athlete in an overhead squat position like the FMS test of Gray Cook. And I'm just gonna let this run through for a sec. And now you're starting to, to work with the athlete. Can you describe to us what you're, what you're after here? So I think, I think I'm talking to a community that's probably pretty familiar with this concept, but basically like I, I do a thing called squat school with all the players. And it's basically a, it, I call it squat school, but it's an alignment school that basically we teach hinging and then eventually we teach a squat, obviously. But the point of the, these videos was just to say that we try to do these corrective exercises and mo mobilizing the joints, but realistically this guy's limitation was not actually a, a joint mobility problem. It was the nervous system problem. And actually I would venture to say, I mean, I would say upwards of 90%, especially with the younger people you work with, maybe older people have more true mobility restrictions from scar tissue or surgeries or whatever it might be. But a lot of the younger people we work with don't really have true, true, like, tissue restriction mobility issues it's more of a, neuro a neurological problem and so the first thing that he showed was obviously an unassisted overhead squat the next thing he showed was me as soon as I hold his hands all of a sudden the mobility opens up and he's able to get down lower I mean that's horrific and he's in a bad position as soon as I hold his hands in a system his joints allow him to move through a, a larger range of motion and then really the the step between that so I I basically demonstrate to these guys, hey, you don't have a mobility issue, stop stretching your hips. I mean, you can do that, but it's not really solving your problem. The thing that you need to do is teach your body from a neurological standpoint, how to get in that position safely. So then that's why the next, the in-between step of me holding his hands is him using the wall. So he uses the wall because then he knows, okay, because your body, your body doesn't know, in a situation like this, your body does not know whether you're on the edge of a cliff or you're on a soft turf like you see here. So if your body doesn't know, it's going to try to keep you on your feet. And if it tries to keep you on your feet, at some point, your joints are going to lock up and it's going to say, wait, 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 don't go any lower because if you go any lower, I'm going to fall on my ass and I might fall off a cliff. I don't know. Your body doesn't know. So here, if you have the wall to support, if you have the wall to support him, you can safely get into that position. And I say safely, just meaning from a nervous system standpoint, like your, your body's like, okay, I can go here because I know I'm not going to fall over because we're constantly trying to stay on our feet. That's, you know we forget that concept because we mastered walking when we were two or three, not master, but we started walking when we were two or three, but you forget that your body is constantly trying to keep you on your feet and keep you away from death or falling over. So we're wired for the survival. So at some point, if you don't have support, like you see in this video, if you don't have support, your joints are going to lock up and say, don't go any lower because I'm going to fall over. And realistically, your body's like, yeah, I might die if I fall over, even though consciously we understand that that's probably not the case. So you provide a little bit of support and all of a sudden he can get into a better position. And that's within, this is within like a day or two. So it's not really, it wasn't a bunch of stretching or joint, joint mobilizing, you know, manipulating the nervous system is mobilizing your joints, which I think we're going to get to with some breathing stuff that we did at Exos in the fall. But um, sometimes joint mobility is just nervous system related, which again, I think I'm talking to a community that, that, that probably at least believes that but I'm just not sure how many people have put that fully into practice and can let go of, okay, we're going to do breathing, but we're also going to do 15 minutes of joint mobility. And that's different. But again, that's teaching the athlete or the client. You're, you're verbally teaching them that breathing is not joint mobility, but it's all, it's all mobility. This reminds me of this quote from Gray. So Gray and I had a conversation, which I've mentioned before. 
and we talked about what's behind a mobility problem, which Rachel, you just gave us some really great uh, techniques that we can employ immediately, some methods. Gray said, when we run up against a mobility problem, we want to identify it, which is what you did. It could be a variety of things. It could be poor stability, it could be neural issue, it could be whatever. Um, uh, and I asked, uh, when you see the restriction in weight-bearing and non-weight-bearing positions, as well as both passive and active tests, does that indicate we should mobilize the tissue first? So, so Mike Boyle and Gray Cook have this joint-by-joint uh, -joint approach where they identify if it's a stability or mobility problem. And in those cases where it is based on their algorithm, a mobility problem, um, people are believing that there is a if then. So if it is a true mobility problem, then you have to do the mobility drills like half kneeling with the stick and uh, you keep uh, the knee and the hip aligned and you mobilize at the ankle joint in order to help with the depth of the squat. But Gray concluded in, in this remark, the message is not the method. The overriding dictum is to show me you have influenced mobility. So even where the algorithm suggests it's not a stability problem and it is a mobility problem, still, still Gray would agree that if you can improve the deficit by whatever means, that is the goal. Uh, and I found this to be very hard to get out of him. Uh, we went back and forth on this for maybe about 10 or 15 minutes. It's in a interview that Larry Draper uh, uh, recorded, it's on her website. Uh, you can access it from First Principles of Movement. Uh, it, it's actually transcribed. Um, and the, the, off, the criticism I often hear is that, yes, if, it's, if you do the diagnostic and you determine it is primarily a stability problem, uh, then, of course, you'll do stability training. Uh, but if the problem is there in weight-bearing and non-weight-bearing, then it is a true mobility problem and you need to do all of those stretches. And so all these people, not just in Major League Baseball, but in rehab, they're using these algorithms and then they're investing a lot of time in mobilizing tissues. And I think that uh, if they did an empirical trial, uh, they would find that even when the algorithm says it's a mobility problem, still it may not be a mobility problem. It may be that you haven't challenged the nervous system enough. Maybe you need more load. Maybe, maybe you need more variability. And so to give variability, one of the things that we do is we do a lot of constraints-based motor learning. You shared this, Rachel. I absolutely love this. This is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> massive skills <laughs> what a great shirt massive skills so uh talk to us about uh, why you wanted to share this with us um i mean i don't think he's received a lot of mechanical instruction but his body is just organized to that and so it's it's Incredible. There is a little bit of a constraint here with the hallway, which is actually something that we've used at the professional level um, with thrower that I've encountered over my in my career with throwers of like the narrow doorway is actually what we called it is there is a little bit of a constraint here. So all all he's really having to do is throw that ball straight and obviously his body just organizes. We talk in baseball a lot where some of the advantages of getting Latin American players sometimes is that they haven't been coached. So no coach has said okay, now put your foot here. Now put your arm here. Now do this. They just do it. They just, they've, they've used the natural constraints of whatever they have and they're just trying to throw a ball as hard as they can and it ends up how it ends up. And so you see this kid, it's just, the body is going to organize. And I mean, he can't be more than four. I'm not an expert on age here, but um, his body is just organized. He has beautiful uh, throwing mechanics. It's amazing how beautiful they are. <laughs> they self-organized. Yeah. So, so this is uh... Uh, from Chris Miller. He's with the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Association now and used to be at Altus. I don't tell my guys uh, where a certain movement should happen. Set up the environment and let them figure it out. Um, it, it, it speaks to our role as designers, as architects. Uh, and, and this was you at Exos 
Um, I'll so just let it run. I kept talking, kept talking, and then all I did was put a hurdle in front of them, and I could see again. I don't know if this is too big. The hurdle is actually what makes him stop going forward. So if I wasn't careful, I would have been like, I would have come to a couple of things that could have said, yeah. this guy's listening to me, um, he's not intelligent enough, he did, yeah. well, he's really young, he doesn't get it, he has uh, physical limitation, his hips are all out of whack, we gotta breathe, we gotta visit, and all I did was stick a hurdle in front of him, and voila, it changed everything. Okay, so that's the physical constraints of approach. Now, everyone take your phone out. All right, so you want to uh, uh, describe a little bit more about uh, how that influences your coaching style? Yeah, so I think that, and, and again, I think I, um, just in case people haven't stalked me and know my background, like I, I've been to a PRI course um, and believe that there's a lot of value there. I was immersed in DNS training for two years with the St. Louis Cardinals. Um, my first ever internship ever was at Exos or Athletes Performance. And I've been immersed in corrective exercise and breathing techniques for a long time. And I firmly believe in their benefit. But um, as, we, as you heard me say in that video, I think sometimes if someone can't do a movement, we're very quick to say, oh, well, there's a mobility issue or there's a, you know, there's a, um, there's a, an intelligence or an IQ issue or whatever it might be. And we go, oh, well, he's, he's limited. But what if it's actually our fault that we just haven't found the right thing or the cue? And so in that particular video, you saw me put a uh, hurdle in front of the player. And are you, do you want me to explain the piece of paper yeah. thing, Craig? Sure. So, the, so in this next video, which I'll just explain it, basically what happened here is we were doing some um, range of motion testing, some rotational range of motion testing with the thoracic rotation and also hip rotation. And so in the video you see, there's like, we had 40 motion sensors on them. And obviously many, many of you have probably done this. You sit your client down and you have them like rotate on a bench to see their thoracic mobility or their ability to rotate and their knees come apart, right? So you kind of you cross their feet over, you change their position to make their knees stay together. And what was happening in these, this video is I'm like, I mean, probably for an hour at first, because we were doing testing with all of our athletes, I was like, keep your knees together, keep your knees together, keep your knees together. And then all, like, I was just getting frustrated, even with some of our most intelligent athletes and athletes that work really hard, they weren't able to do it. And finally, I put a piece of paper between their knees and I was like, keep the piece of paper between your knees. And then all of a sudden they did it automatically and I was completely, my problems were gone. So I think that sometimes we're very, very quick to jump to they don't have the physical ability to do it or they've got a limitation or they need to breathe or their breathing is wrong or their diaphragm or their this or that. And realistically, like maybe we're just not giving them the, the right environment to get the, the behavior that we want. So this uh, makes me, it makes me think about uh, how important it is to shift the attention. Um, and there was a study uh, with uh, runners who collapse in and they were um, uh, told to squeeze their glutes and they didn't collapse in. But the problem was that it, there was poor retention. And then they were um, uh, told to imagine that there was a big window between their knees and they didn't all consciously fire their glutes. In fact, they were wired. And this was a study by Rich Willie from Utah um, they were wired, they found more efficient and more variable ways to achieve the goal of the knees not collapsing in and controlling the frontal plane when landing. And those people that were allowed to problem solve on their own, come up with their own unique solutions, um, they were the ones who were able to retain the improved uh, uh, kinematics. Um, so I think it kind of goes to shifting the focus from it being uh, the, the, the rib that's lifted on the left or the glutes that aren't active to just creating these environments where people problem solve on their own. Otherwise, they start to have that toxin. So here it says low levels of protective factors um, uh, are the solution, are the, the, um, the balm for people. And when people uh, don't have resilient strategies, they begin to have the nocebo in their mind. Oh, I'm not firing my glutes. They have all these negative thoughts. Oh, uh, 
I'm, 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 I'm gonna break if my knees go in, or I'm not gonna throw the ball well when I get tired if my left rib cage flies open. Um, <laughs> am I right? <laughs> Yeah. You know, these are nocebos. These are toxins. Um, if we can build up resilience, then people can handle uh, fatigue. Uh, Buddy Morris, one of the great s &C coaches in American sports with the Cardinals uh, in football, uh, he, he says how a person manages fatigue, how they land, how they change directions, um, uh, is how he defines a great athlete. Um, uh, so it's under stress. It's when they're not thinking. Um, and we've talked about this before, this idea of the relationship, the environment and the person um, and guiding by the side, obviously in, in, uh, in working with horses, uh, the ecological validity of the training, uh, the constraints, the cues are so much different. The feedback is so much different. Um, I know Matt Lowe is with us today and, and he's been part of a number of these conversations uh, about creating um, uh, creating uh, the right environment where the person is safe and challenged. Um, and uh, I think that, that, that these ideas, we want to really grind them in uh, to get us away from the overcorrective mentality. Uh, looking at Stuart McMillan at Altus, uh, uh, have we got coaching all wrong? Should our goal be to bypass the cognitive conscious understanding entirely? Why was there ever an argument? Birds don't know an aerodynamics to be able to fly. Uh, skills are almost always subconscious. And, and your video of the, uh, uh, of the hallway for the four or five-year-old boy to self-organize and auto-regulate what looked like incredible mechanics was, was a stunning example. Of, of these same ideas about using, using the environment. So here's, here's Verlander, Justin Verlander, and somebody came up with the bright idea of putting that ball there uh, as an example of guiding by the side. So this is all Alfred stuff. And, and um, I, 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 I saw this quote on Carmen Bott's uh, uh, feed. Uh, it's from the Franz Bosch book, and it's, it's from Gab Wolf, who, uh, is somebody that both Nick Winkleman and I have uh, really uh, gained incredible respect for because she, she's one of the, the great researchers of guiding by the side and using external instead of internal cues. And, and she says, precise movement correction by strength coaches and PTs during trunk control exercises is not so much a sign of professional expertise as much as a sign of ignorance about how movements are actually controlled. Well-intentioned but misapplied expertise can be highly damaging. And I don't know if it's accurate for Gab Wolf to say this isn't a sign of how things are controlled. It probably is how they're controlled, but it, what it may not be is, is how they're learned. So motor control is great, but motor control isn't motor learning. To me, motor learning is skill acquisition, and, and we're responsible for the culture and the environment for that. And, and we've shared examples like this uh, to this point about how it's not cognitive and Yonda taught us that we should uh, avoid the cognitive stage of motor learning. Uh, we should bypass it or run through it as quickly as possible, explain the why behind the what of, 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 of the method, but then create an environment where people are problem solving. Once you've got them motivated, once you have the buy-in and the relatedness, um, we, we want to get people experiencing challenges um, and getting out of this trap, which, which is crazy, but yet we all fall back into it all the time. Um, and I shared this video with Nick, and I wanna share it with, with you also, Rachel, to get your, your, your comments on it. This is Dan Paff talking about um, economy and queuing and knowing your athlete. Whoops, maybe I'm not gonna show it, let's see. And then how much time is spent, like, is all year, is it a, like a coordination and a, and a how you're running focus, is that through the whole year? Or like as you get like really close to an event, is it more just, are they always thinking about form? Depends on the individual, depends on the problem. <laughs> uh, some people can handle 
handle monitoring. Mm -hmm. Some can't. Right. So certain times of the year, say, say I'm OCD. Well, I probably don't want to monitor too many things if I'm in competition phase. Yeah. Yeah. But well, like a lot of field events, they can juggle three or four balls in their event. So like on a long jump, they may be able to monitor what they're doing at the start, something in the middle of the run, something on takeoff, something on landing. So they can juggle four balls and it doesn't really interfere. It's, and it's what, how intense is the lottery. But I've had world-class long jumpers, they can juggle one ball. I'm like, if you talk about something over here, everything else goes to shit. This is perfect. <laughs> But everything else looks like they've never been to a track meet. <laughs> so a lot of this is how do they manage self-talk? How do they manage kinesthetic monitoring? Um, art of coaching, you know, do you know what to monitor for that person? Like, what's the worst virus? Like, you, you can see 50 things wrong. But if you find the right virus, maybe 40 disappear because that virus is the trigger for 40 other things. Yeah. Oh. Rachel? I mean, I, I don't know if I can really say it better than the, the man, the myth, and the legend himself, but um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I would agree with that. It's like, I, I don't believe that we as coaches shouldn't say anything. I think there's just a time and a place and cognitive understanding, especially with athletes that are coming up and are younger, they actually do want to know the why, you know, they want the information and especially with the technology age and even the, just in a broad sense, the internet where there's so much information available and people, they Google stuff, you know, like kids Google stuff or they probably Instagram it more than they Google it. But I mean, I think that, I think that the type of player that or client that we're seeing with younger people maybe even do want a cognitive understanding. However, that doesn't mean that you are feeding them information at every stage of the game, depending on what phase of competition they're in. If, are, they, are they leading up to, is it 30 minutes before the game that you're trying to talk about mechanics? Like probably not. You probably want to dig into that during COVID times or the off season. Um, and that's some of what we're doing right now with our players is just going back and forth about mechanics. And it's okay to talk about that because we actually don't even know when they're going to compete again right now. So it's okay to talk about those things. It's okay to analyze video at some point. It's okay to talk about anatomy and physiology and some of those deep concepts, but it's knowing how much, when, and with who. And I've made plenty of mistakes in that area because you, you never really know for sure because actually an athlete could show up one day in a bad mood and they don't want to hear anything you have to say. And you should just on that day, create the environment and let them go play in it. And if it's not perfect, it's not perfect, but you don't know what the athlete's going through or what they've experienced in the past. So I think that's, just his point, knowing who you're talking to, which is easier said than done, uh, especially because that could fluctuate from day to day or week to week. Yeah, I love that. And I think that um, uh, it's crucial for us to um, know the right time. Obviously, Dan's talking about knowing your athlete and some athletes, it's one cue, some maybe it's three or four. Some you can afford to give them more to think about. And also it may be about the timing of that, uh, whether it's uh, in a practice session, a technical session versus uh, a, a gym session where they're going for higher intensities uh, or, or a pregame situation. They're all, they're all unique and, and we have to be very empathetic to understand. And, and Matt Lowe has talked about this and Laura Latham who's with us from Boston. She's always talking about getting to know your patient, this, this therapeutic alliance, this dialogue that we have. It doesn't matter um, uh, what the sport is, whether it's rehab or training or performance or competition, um, uh, being able to realize that it's not about us, it's about them is, is probably one of the crucial things. I wanna show Marisol again here. Yes, and now a race. Good, and come down. Yeah. Good, go sideways, go to the right. And circle this little tree over here, to the right. 
Yeah, go around it and then go down. Beautiful, all the way down, back down to the big tree. Oh, perfect. I don't know if you can hear those birds, but <laughs> it's an amazing thing. And Rachel, you know how, how, uh, incredible it is when you change all the senses. So in dynamic systems theory, there's the person and the task and the environment and, and, and varying the stimuli. There's so many ways to vary the stimuli. Here, the ground is different. Uh, we change the slope there, her orientation, things like that. Just getting people out of what they're used to is probably really powerful for them. I don't know your thoughts on yeah. that. Uh, oh, I think you know my thoughts on that, Craig. Yeah, I mean, I like, I, I can't agree more. It's just, uh, even, even with, so I know the foot is coming next. So I was going to say being barefoot. Okay. Wow. How, yeah, we're on the same page, uh, being barefoot and allowing, like, we forget that our feet are just like our hands, you know? So we want to have stimulus. Like I always liken it to, would you ever deadlift with a pair of mittens on? Well, no, because that would decrease the stimulus to your hands or your ability to actually feel. Would you ever throw a pitch with, with a glove on? No because you're decreasing your ability to have that, that really fine touch on the baseball and our feet are the same way, but we often put shoes on and, and our, our, our feet are so deconditioned, you know, our ancestors and, and uh, even <laughs> uh, whose feet are those? Those feet are uh, players. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. Ryan, Ryan, basically um, well, our, our feet are confined to shoes and our feet are so deconditioned that I actually try to walk barefoot um, I haven't been doing it as much because I've just been kind of out of my routine and my plays, which I should be doing, but walk barefoot on gravel, you know, walk barefoot on surfaces that might be a little bit painful and give your feet the stimulus. So, I mean, we're looking at here, if you want to stop, like the importance of what we're doing to our feet is really, um, I like, I always like to say like the feet are the window into the, into the hips. If your eyes are the window into your soul, the feet are the window into the hips. So if I look at someone's feet and we look at here, his feet are turned out, his ankles are collapsed, his, he's forming bunions on both toes, looks like more so on the right side. That's all a product of how he's walked over a long period of time and also probably shoe wear that he's been wearing. Um, Ryan, <laughs> those aren't as nearly a spot as mine. Um, so we're seeing the feet are, are misshapen because of shoe wear, but also because of hip dysfunction. And those things go in a, in a vicious cycle. And I know we're kind of running out of time, so I don't know how, how much you want me to talk on this, but if there are questions, I can take them now. Um, but I, I like what you're doing with Marisol. Is that, that's your client's name? But mm -hmm. I would also like, you know, take the shoes off. You know, your toes, like our toes are so inflexible because they're in these, uh, Kelly Strick calls them shoe pr uh, feet pr foot prisons. We're in our foot prisons. So they become immobile and also just like, just they're, fra they're fragile. Your feet are, are very soft. Like I have calluses on the bottom of my feet and it's because I try to walk barefoot as much as I can. And even on, on surfaces that are uncomfortable because I'm just trying to provide stimulus that's really taken away when you put on shoes that have thick, thick soles, which of course, I mean, you saw me when I was lifting in the woods earlier in that video, I was wearing hiking boots. So, I mean, there's a time and a place of course, but I try to do it as much as possible. I'm really conscious about what type of footwear I'm wearing and also how much I'm wearing shoes. Yonda had a great term for the, for this. Um, he said, we have dead feet. Dead a hundred percent. you look at those feet are dead in that picture. Uh, there's some questions here. Um, okay. Well, Felix, maybe send me an email. He I was asking about getting into baseball. Um, that's probably a longer conversation. Um, yeah, that's a longer conversation. Felix can shoot me an email or reach out to me through my website. Um, how do I end up as specifically as a hitting coach? I can talk a little about, about that if we have time, but Craig, do you want me to keep going with systems? Yeah, let's, we, can, we, can, um, uh, we can hit some of your eye tracking stuff in just a sec. I want to just touch on your uh, ideas about systems thinking and that we get into this trap of uh, becoming slave of methods and systems. And it's, it's uh, I think, uh, Andy, Andy uh, 
uh, Chan uh, posted something, uh, one of Ryan's reload teammates, about uh, principles and systems and, and methods. And principles were at like the, bo the bottom of the foundation. And it goes back to Dostoevsky where he said, man has such a predilection for systems and deductions that he is ready to distort the truth intentionally. He's ready to deny the evidence of his senses only to justify his logic. And I think it explains how we've gotten into this place today where we weren't prepared for this black swan event, yet we had all of the warnings. We had MERS and SARS and we have Ebola once in a while. And we had developed uh, 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 strategies that then we turned away from tra with tragic consequences. Um, and we're all in this together, yet the dialogue, uh, the lack of transparency between China and the United States has, has really um, uh, led this to becoming so out of control. Nobody is dealing with the COVID epidemic worse than the United States. Um, and so uh, we see how important it is that uh, we, um, all see ourselves as a global community. Um, some of these ideas about America first really just don't make sense. And we have people here from all over the world. Jackie is here from Shenzhen um, and uh, we have um, Bellin from, from Bolivia. Uh, we have Graham from England. Uh, uh, we have people here from, from Switzerland like Tomas. Um, and I've already mentioned the other countries. So uh, we're all sharing this uh, experience and hopefully we're gonna come out of this realizing that we're all connected in ways. Uh, you can't prevent the virus from going from Wuhan uh, through wealthy people, business travelers to Europe and then hitting New York City where Ryan is. Uh, you could close off Wuhan, but the wealthy have already uh, have already traveled and brought the virus with them and infected Europe and then and then New York City uh, while people are just sitting oblivious thinking that China has taken care of this problem uh, when in fact uh, it's simmering all over the world and who ends up suffering is not the wealthy people who brought it to Europe from Wuhan and then to New York City it's the people whose social determinants of health compromise their ability uh, to have um, uh, a positive lifestyle. They don't have personal trainers. Um, they have hypertension. They have type two diabetes that isn't managed well. They have a lot of stress in their life. And so we see the difference between rich and poor people as far as COVID-19 is extreme. So um, we have to kind of take a step back um, and I think this is part of what Dostoevsky is talking to us about. You wrote beautifully here, Rachel, if you're following one system that somebody wrote 10 years ago, consider this question. Does that person even follow his or her own system in the book as close as you follow? I mean, I'm telling people, you better burn second edition rehab at the spine because I ain't <laughs> following that shit. You know, you've been dropping F-bombs, Rachel. I've been a pretty good boy so far today, but F that. Okay, yeah. F that, you know, we've learned a lot. I, I made a pivot when I researched the functional training handbook and discovered the field of skill acquisition, discovered what coach John Wooden knew about guiding by the side and don't give corrections if it causes resentment. Uh, the goal is to create an environment where people problem solve on their own. That's transferable. It's not sport specific training. It's not corrective motor control exercises, which Matt Lowe has shown um, are on very, very thin ice historically. Um, it's not how we learn. Um, the problem with systems that are sold in text is that people that write them are evolving, but the book stays the same. Consider using systems like tools. Be familiar with many and maybe even strong in your knowledge of some um, that you're able to call on when you need. And so this gets to Stuart McMillan's idea of being a generalist, having broad intellectual curiosity as a key to true special expertise. So, so Rachel, what do, you, what do you want to share with us about, about this? I find it to be, in my mind, your most powerful insights of all about, about not getting trapped by systems. Yeah, um, and I, I've actually gotten strangely close to Stu over the past uh, recent time here. And we just talk about this all the time is like, be a generalist because you, you have to be able to have, you have to be able to draw from many things. I, I, don't, I don't always like to see in people's, you know, profiles or their, 
signatures. It's, it's like PRI certified, DNS certified. I'm a um, LDOA person. I'm a ART person. I'm a this person or that person. And it's like, that really makes you weak as a practitioner when you can only call on one thing. And of course we all have our strengths. Like we have things that we know really, really well, but you should know a lot of different things. Um, and I think Stu says it well here is have, have a broad intellectual curiosity, have, have not just depth, but breadth and be able to talk about many different things. Um, and, and if you can look at it, and I think Stu even said this, it's like, if you can look at it this high, then you can specialize and you can go, okay, no, I know this person needs this specifically. And maybe you can provide that. Maybe you can't, you can, you can refer out, but if you don't know a broad amount of things and you haven't been in a, a bunch of different learning environments, then it makes it very hard to see it from different perspectives. Impossible. It's impossible to see it from different perspectives. So, um, and that's also kind of just, it's how I live my life. You know, I've lived in 15 different cities. I've traveled all over the world and that's, partly because of my job, but I, I definitely welcome those experiences and partly it's intentional and I do it on purpose because I like to see things from many, many, many different perspectives so that I can understand from, from different, different environments and physically as well. You know, I train different ways. I, I'm swimming or I'm running or I just w went for a run yesterday for four miles that I haven't done often. I wasn't trained for it and I haven't been training for it, but like, who cares? You know, we have to it's like we put ourselves in these little boxes, both in our physical training, but also just in our life, you know? And so I think being a generalist in, in, in like a very broad concept, concept outside of sports performance or rehab or, or whatever uh, section of the field that you're in, in a broad context in your life is also probably very important to have different perspectives so you can, you know, come zoom back in and treat people better and, and go through rehab processes better. Ryan, I saw you nodding your head. I, I know when you when we have this conversation, it gets you gets you pretty pumped up. Yeah, yeah. I think um, you know. I think it's, it's the problem is if you don't have the context to a certain perspective, then you know everything's everything looks like a, a a barbell issue if you only know how to use a barbell. So it's just like uh, yeah. you have to have that generalist, I think, knowledge to, to give context to, or to understand the context of the specialty. And kind of like Rachel was saying, it's like, yeah, if, maybe you refer out if you know that's not for you, but you wouldn't even know that's not right for you unless you had that broad base of knowledge. So I think it's super important. I think it's like same thing that happens to spine surgeons or, you know, even us as practitioners, like we, our calling card is the only one we have. Then, you know, we're trying to force it on everybody. It's just, you know, it's not, best way to go about things. But I really feel that you've gone a step further too, Ryan, because uh, you're a doctor of physical therapy. Um, and yet in your, uh, your environment where you work with people, you don't call them patients. Yeah. So that's, that's like, dis that's a disruptive influence. That, that's changing the game changing the expectations. So, so what sort of, what sort of triggered that for you? It's, it's uh, very unusual. I think it's like, it's labeling somebody, right? It's telling them there's something wrong with them. If they're a patient, then that means they're sick and they need to be fixed. Right. And that's, <laughs> that's the whole Alfred and Batman thing is, is no, they need a coach, they need a guide to, to help them discern what's going on and help them make decisions and then teach them how to make those decisions for themselves over time. So, I like client better. I don't like patient. Uh, that's why we're in the gym. The gym has an aspirational um, and and performance feel instead of a, a uh, sterile and and quiet you know situation. And then that that pivot was really important. And then the next pivot was from the gym to virtual. It's like, well, if we want you to be independent in your own life, let me see you in your own life in your own home. Let me see. Let me let's let's start making that more transferable that way too. So. Um, yeah, just just trying to implement what you guys are showing me. Wow. So, in effect, the toxin of uh, the term arm care, the language which we talked about with Nick last week, uh, toxin of different cues, internal cues, et cetera, um, of an environment that isn't variable enough or isn't challenging enough, the toxin of, of the labels, you have a herniated disc, a hip impingement, um, the toxin of the availability of elective procedures <laughs> uh, so that people aren't uh, uh, 
motivated to try to figure shit out. Um, yeah. The toxin of calling people patients. <laughs> it, it, it's so important. It's so interesting how um, our environment and language are so tied together. I've mentioned it before when I, on my trips to China, my host Tom Zhao has talked about how do children learn. Even before they understand language, they're learning through the environment, through the experience, through their eyes, through, through uh, the example of their family, their parents. Um, and then they explore and they experience and it's empirical. Um, and then they grow and they learn. And, and like you said with this boy, nobody's taught this boy how to throw. <laughs> you just, somebody, a parent just gave him a ball and then had the, the genius to have him throw in a hallway. <laughs> and look at that. Either what, way it works. I'm not sure if that was intentional, but either way it works. Yeah, who cares? Accidents, right? Um, uh, we, we, we thought the world was flat. We thought the sun rotated around the earth and all of a sudden uh, we had the ability to observe uh, things in a different way and we realized we were wrong so that's that's curiosity and i think we'll probably finish uh i know we started a little bit late so it, it's it's we're pretty much right up against it but i think we can finish with this thought about keeping a, an open mind um there we go. Keeping an open mind for new ideas that sometimes shows what we thought or believed before is wrong, which is what Dr. Levitt says. And here's the great jazz trumpeter, Wynton Marsalis, talking also about what's behind this intellectual curiosity, this ability to, to uh, think in a dis disruptive way, um, the ability um, you know, uh, to be creatively destructive, like, like my patient, Ethan Penner said, and I know you like that one, Rachel. Uh, here's Wynton Marsalis, humility engenders learning because it beats back the arrogance that puts blinders on and leaves you open for truths to reveal themselves. So all we have to do is open our eyes with objectivity, which I think is Dostoevsky's point. The prejudice of our status quo bias and vested interests, uh, the prejudice of of being constrained robotically by all, by all of the, the ways we were imprisoned by our past, that's all gone right now. So this is, a, this is a, a, an opportunity. Do you know how to tell when someone is humble? I believe there's a simple test because they consistently observe and listen the humble improved. So the biggest take home from COVID-19 is it's been forced upon us. Can we continue to challenge the status quo and keep keep learning. And, and Rachel, I just wanna let you take us out with some words of wisdom of what you hope to bring to the Yankees maybe and, and how you're not done yet. Um, um, because behind, well, that, actually, behind that is all of these messages. Yeah, I, so I, I always use the hashtag, I'm not done yet, it's pretty much the only one I use it. It's just, it's just a, I constantly feel very confident and very not confident. And I just, like this quote said, it's like being humble creates this thirst for knowledge because if you feel like you're dumb, then you feel like you have to, you feel like you have a lot of work to do. Um, and actually Garrett DeJong asked a really good question that can kind of like summarize all of this is how, how, how to manage too much too soon with conditioning of our feet. I think one of the takeaways of this with just arm care and training to be robust and all that is I don't want to make it sound like I've never had any problems with this. And it's like, if you, if you're pushing someone to the edge of, of what they're capable of, sometimes you're going to go over the edge and they're going to fall off the cliff. So in rehab and no one ever likes to hear that. No one ever, and that's why we manage away from a load. And that's why we are so conservative. And that's why we, you know, shy away from things is because sometimes that means you might take someone too fast in rehab and then they have a setback. And yes, that no one wants to do that. But what it, I think the bigger risk is not getting to that edge. And so how do you manage too much too soon with conditioning of your feet is the same way you ma help manage too much too soon with anything else. And I think it's, well, sometimes, sometimes you find the dark place that you don't want to and you cut your foot open. Sorry, you know, if you didn't, if you don't die, then you're going to come back and it's going to be fine. And, and we're all, you know, if, if you didn't die, yeah, you cut your foot open, damn, that sucks. Well, now you know that was a little too much and you're not going to go walking on glass again. Okay, well, we, 
we learned. So I think, and, and that no one, everyone likes to promise their clients or their athletes or their people, they like to promise, I'm gonna get you there fast and with no pain and it's gonna be easy. I think we should start promising our athletes and our clients and our patients that it's not gonna be easy. There's gonna be some pain. There might even be a setback, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna be as aggressive with you as possible to set you up for the most success in the future. Wow, holy cow. Uh, that's amazing. I'm glad we got that out of you, Rachel. It took two two visits together, <laughs> but that that is the that's really a tour de force. And uh, let's just say goodbye to everybody. I want to thank Aaron and Geronimo and Ryan, of course, and and you, Rachel, very very much. And I want to thank everybody. We have people here from Africa, from South America, from Europe, and from North America, maybe. Uh, We'll find somebody on a cruise ship and, and it's stuck in Antarctica <laughs> that has access to the web. But uh, it's just been an honor for me to take everybody through all these webinars. And uh, we'll see you guys next Sunday with Nick Winkleman. And thank you very, very, very much for, for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Take care. Thank you.